There you go. Been a while. Forgot how to turn it on. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. I love you too. Man, it is a joy to be here this morning. It's a joy to get to be able to stand before you and share God's word. But I want to tell you something. I appreciate so much. Drew and Nate did a marvelous job, an awesome job in walking us through the essentials. Give them a hand, will you? They, I, listen, we are so blessed. I, uh, I appreciate so much, uh, though, your prayers, your cards. And uh, uh, Emily sitting over here, she's my physical therapist. She's smiling at me. So I, asked, I told her that I said, Emily, what happens at PT stays at PT, okay? Uh, you can't come back and say, man, I, I, you cried like a big baby, you know? So, uh, but anyway, I asked, her this, I asked her the other day, I said, can I take this thing off while I preach? Because the doctor had said I can take it off at home, I can take it off in the office, but when I'm out in public, I had to wear it. I said, I feel like I would be like a T-Rex trying to preach this morning. And uh, so she told me I could, but I have to put it back on when I get done. So you just probably won't see me throw this hand up too far, Okay. But anyway, we are glad to be here this morning and excited to walk you through uh, literally our last message in the essentials as we're going to talk about faith as an essential. Take your Bibles, turn if you will to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 today. And I want you to understand that when you and I begin to think about and talk about faith and why I believe it's an essential, it is the bedrock core of who we are. It is uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know that from the Word of God. And I want you to know this morning that there is absolutely no movement, there is no advancement in the Christian life whatsoever apart from exercising faith. Zero. I don't care how much you may know, I don't care what your theology may be, I don't care how much you may know about God, I don't care how much you may talk about God. But there is absolutely no movement, no advancement in the Christian walk, in the Christian faith, apart from exercising that faith. Think about this. You get into to this life by faith, but you also live this life by faith. When you look at the Word of God, what you're going to discover about faith, it's not, it's not about having faith in faith. It's, it's, it's not faith in your abilities. But in the Bible, faith is always, always vertical. You may say, what do you mean by that, Rick? Well, faith is always looking to the object and where you're putting that faith. That object should be and ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's who you place your confidence in. It's who you believe in. Remember that faith in the Bible is not simply faith in what you want. Faith is basically you trusting the God who has a purpose and a plan for your life, and you are willing to take action. You're willing to step out. You're, there's movement, if you will, always when it comes to this sense of faith. So let me give you this morning just kind of a summary statement, if I can, of what real faith is, and I believe really what kind of summarizes the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and here it is. The power of your life and the power of your impact is simply this. It is a manifestation of your confidence in God. Let me say that to you again. That when you look in this chapter, the measure of your great significance, the measure of your impact, the measure of your difference that you're going to make in life always, always depends upon your confidence in God. When you sit down and begin to read this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, what you'll discover is this journey in life, your life and my life, is simply not using God to get done what you want to get done. That's not what life is. And I think that's the reason why so many Christians today get disillusioned and get disappointed with God, because they're operating, if you will, from a false premise. And that false premise is simply this, that God exists to help me fulfill my dreams and to fulfill my desires for whatever I want to accomplish and do in life. Can I tell you, if you think that way, if you believe that way, you're going to always be disappointed in God, and most of all, you're going to be disappointed in your life. You and I, hear me, you and I exist simply to fulfill the dreams and the vision that God has for your life and my life. And you have to understand that. You cannot live life apart from that understanding. That's why when I think about faith, that, that faith is here simply for you and I to understand that it's not about my, my life doing what I want to do, but it's my life who has been totally surrendered and yield to the will of the Father through the Holy Spirit who now lives inside of me and lives inside of you, and to live this life as I got into this life by faith. Now, when you look in Hebrews chapter 11 in verses 1 through 6, and that's where we're going to kind of rest today, 
There are three incredible statements that I want you to see about faith. The first one is this. The faith is the confident reality of the future. Probably the closest thing that I can find to a definition of faith in Scripture would simply be this. Faith is simply God confidence. Let's look at it. Look at verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, technically, that's more of a description than it is a definition. It's describing, if you will, what faith is. Listen to it again. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Family, when you sit down and begin to read Hebrews chapter 11, you come to the conclusion that faith is always, always lodged in God's Word. It's what God said. It's not human speculation. It's not untethered, if you will, desire. In other words, faith is the response to what God initiates. Always. For instance, you get a report that you got cancer. You've gone to the doctor. You've had tests run. And I know what that phone call is like uh, to receive on the other end that the doctor says, hey, Rick, you've, you've got prostate cancer. But I will tell you, when you get that kind of report, it does one of two things. God has now put you in a situation where you have to choose either faith or fear. Either you're going to choose to trust God and believe in God, and I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I'm going to rest in you, and I'm going to believe in you that you've got my well-being at heart, or I'm going to be fearful and fretful and doubting, and I'm going to be running around like a chicken with his head cut off because I'm not trusting or resting in God. But let me show you what God did in that moment. God initiates our faith. You see, faith is not a collection of simply good ideas that we want God to do or perform for us. Biblical faith is really simply a reality of response to what God has initiated. Now go back and look at the text for a moment. I want you to circle the word hope for a moment. Because he uses this word here, and again, hope is not speculation. It is more than simply a wish list. That is what I'm wanting for my life or where I want to go in my life. Faith is an inward conviction that what God has promised, hear me, he will perform it. If God promised it, you can bet God's going to do it. And this is the reason why I'm so convinced that God attaches this faith to the promises of his word. It's not your speculation or my speculation because it is what God promised. And if God promised it, God will perform it. Well, let me give you a truth that I want you to hang on to this morning. Don't treat what God tells you as if it's negotiable. Do you hear me? If God leads you to do something, if God's calling you, don't, don't treat it as though it's negotiable. Like, well, I can sit down, I can negotiate with you. Maybe you don't have to go quite as far. Maybe you don't have to give as much. Maybe I have to do this. No. Whatever God tells you to do, do not treat it as though it's negotiable. One of the things I learned even through this study, and, and be honest with you, even before this study, is I'll be honest with you, the, the way that we, the opposite of faith, I used to believe was doubt. So if I don't have faith, then I'm doubting. I'll, I'll be honest with you, what I began to realize some years ago, and this text really confirmed it, is the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. Think about it. Faith always will thrust us into the gap. Faith will always thrust you into that situation. It will always thrust you into the context of adversity. So that what happens in the midst of that, you begin to realize and discover that, you know what, what I'm facing right now is larger than the resources that I can manage. In other words, I can't do this. So what faith does, faith always forces you to deal with your fears. Think about your own life. Think about what you faced already within your lifetime. Have you been in that gap or in that situation where, where God is causing you to have to trust him. As I said, you either choose faith or you choose fear. And in the midst of that, what happens is all of a sudden you see God come through. And in the midst of that, you begin to recognize that your God is larger and bigger than what you're presently facing. That's why I said that the opposite of faith is fear. Now look down to verse 3. Verse 3 is a great illustration of what he just said in verse 1. 
He said, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let me read that to you again. By faith, not by intellect, not by speculation, not even by debate. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. Why? So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. You see, Rick, what is he saying here? He's saying that faith literally makes visible what others cannot see. But can I tell you, it's also something more and greater than that. Because what he's also doing in that little text, he's pointing us to the unquestionable power of our great God. It's almost as though he's saying, if you really want to interpret it, do you really and truly understand who you're putting your faith in? Do you have a grasp? Do you really comprehend today that when you say you put your faith and trust and confidence in this God, that you're placing your faith in the one literally who spoke the world into existence? That you're placing your faith in the one who created the universe and all that is in it? Listen, what you believe in God is not about all the things that you may know or comprehend about yourself. It is about the glory of our great God who came through. It's about the stories, listen to me, that you get to pass on to future generations about how God met you in that moment of darkness and fear, and he gave you the vision, and you believe God right through that situation. It is God, not you. It is how God, not you. It is how God came through. And you know what you had to do? You had to understand that it was God and God alone who saw you through those dark times. You see, faith enables us to believe that the heart and the soul and the future and the present, even though I can't see it, even though I don't understand it, I don't necessarily know how I'm going to get through it, but I'm trusting in you. Why? Because it's not about believing in your greatness or your ability or what you can accomplish. But it's having a big vision of a great God. Second statement that he makes in this text is that faith attracts God's approval. Now, whenever you're reading a section of Scripture, whether it's here or anywhere else in the Word of God, when a word is repeated multiple times, you need to stop, pull over, and park for a little while and take a hard look at it. It's interesting that the word commend is used in this 11th chapter. It's literally used in verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 39. Look at verse 2. He says, for by it the people of old received their commendation. Now, the word commend or commendation is the Greek word motoreo. And what it literally means, it means to witness or to speak well of. Now, here's something that's so interesting in this text. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, what you'll discover is that God is the one who is giving witness on behalf of those who exercise their faith. In other words, He's the one who speaks well of those who put their faith and trustedness in God, but also acted in obedience on whatever it was. So what does he do? He commends them. He says, you want to know who I'm proud of? Abraham, come here. You want to know who I'm proud of? Hey, Rahab, come over here. David, come over here. This is what I'm proud of. So what he does, he commends them. Why? Because they believe God. He commends them for their faith. Why? Because these were men and women who lived this dependent life upon God. They rested upon Him. And because of that, God's dependency always, always brings a commendation from heaven. So with God's commendation, when God commends them, guess what? When God gives His approval, then all of a sudden now, the resources and the blessings of God come cascading into their lives. So what happened is these great men and women that you read in Hebrews chapter 11, you know what happened to them? They got to experience the manifest presence of God and the deliverance of God and the hand and the favor and the touch of an awesome mighty God. And you know what? This was their moment in history where God came through. Why? Because they believed him. If you were to sit down and read verses 4 through 40, it is a snapshot, if you will, of all of these men and women of faith. What I discovered, though, out of all of them, there were elements that were true about all of their lives, every one of them. Let me give them to you this morning. First of all, God spoke through his word. Now, certainly if you know Scripture, we know that the canon of Scripture had not been completed yet. 
So what that tells me, though, is that what God said to them, God actually verbally said it to them personally. But it still means that God spoke through his word, which means that there was objective authority, not personal speculation. In other words, they did not come up with something for God to do. God had something for them to do. So God spoke directly to them through his word. Secondly, they were stirred. Now, what I mean by that is, is that there was this holy discomfort that God began to stir within their heart and their life. There was something that they felt inside of them. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you felt like that God was speaking to you? God was stirring within your heart to do something, to step out in faith, to trust him, to rest in him? Well, let me show you what happens is. When God stirred, they didn't try to sit down and negotiate with God. But what they did is they responded. And listen, church, any time God speaks, it always forces a response. And that response is either I choose to obey or I choose to disobey. Thirdly, they all obeyed. Just read the biographical sketch of these men and women. You know what I've discovered? Faith in the Bible is always a verb even when it's a noun. You say, what do you mean by that? If you don't have faith, if you don't respond in faith. In other words, faith always means obedience. It always means a movement. It always means action. You see, it's not good enough just to simply say, well, God spoke to my heart. It's not good enough to have your heart even stirred by the Holy Spirit if you fail to respond. In other words, you have to act upon what God has told you to do. You have to act upon wherever God has placed you. And then fourthly, notice that God bragged about them. I love this. It says, they received his commendation. Think about this for a moment. God himself became their character witness. Now, I don't know about you, but boy, there would be nobody any better to have as your character witness than God. Amen? So God became their character witness. Has there ever been a time in your life where you were at that gap, if you would, in your life, and you don't know what to do, and you're in this situation, you're literally scared to death, you're shaking within your boots, but even though you are scared and you're frightened and you don't know what to do, you have not embraced fear? And as I said, even though you're shaking, even though you don't know what's going to happen, you're still believing God and you're moving forward in that faith. God says, listen, I am proud of you, my child. That's what he did in David's life. That's what he did in Abraham's life. Listen to me. Some of us in this room this very morning, some of us that are watching online this morning, have never received that kind of God affirmation. You know why? Because God spoke, but we never obeyed. God was calling us to do something, but we said no. God was wanting you to, rather than taking a vacation, going to the lake or going somewhere else, God says, don't you take that vacation. I want you to go on a mission trip. Oh, but God, I don't want to do that. Really? God was saying, are you willing to trust me and believe in me that you can trust me, that I can provide all of your needs if you tithe and give and support? Do you trust him? Do you have faith enough to believe that if God is saying, I want you to move to a new community and a new town and a new school and and, and you're moving across the United States of America to go somewhere you've never been before, do you trust him enough to say, God, I know that you're going to give me the right church. I know it's going to be the right job. I know we're going to make family and friends. And do you trust him in those moments? We're living in a day and an age right now where we're having to trust God, I think, more than any other time in our life. Because we're getting pushed and pulled and identified by the culture and the world. Not long ago, I shared a message with you about our identity because I believe we've got to know who we are in Christ. And if you missed that message, you need to go back and listen to it. Because I got news for you, folks. This world does not define me. Jesus does. Amen? And this is what he's talking about. Do I have faith enough to believe? And I'll be honest with you. In these 66 years that I will turn tomorrow, there have been times that God has looked at me and he said, son, I want you to do this. And I said, okay, God, I will obey you. But I will also have to be honest and tell you there are times that God said, I want you to do this. And I just sat silently. And because of that, I missed these blessings. Some of you are sitting in this room. Some of you are watching me this morning. And you know that God is speaking to you. You know it. 
you have experienced that level of stirring of the Spirit of God within your heart, and there's no question, you know it's God. But you're also allowing fear to cause you to rationalize and reach in and grab verses out of context to wash away your obedience. Can I challenge you to do some? Go home this afternoon, sit down, and just read this 11th chapter of Hebrews. Let God speak to your heart. And when he shows you what to do, have faith enough in him to step out in faith and to say, God, I trust you. Thirdly and finally, faith is evidence of our intimacy with God. This faith life was never about a pick and choose. It was not about an a la carte go through and I pick this and leave this and go on. Faith was never meant to be that in the Christian life. Faith is an expression of drawing near and close to God. Look at verse 6. He says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For whomever would draw, or whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Look at that little phrase, and without faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. There are two words in this text I want you to circle. One is the word believe, the other is rewards. He says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Now here he's talking about the fact that you have to have this sense of where you have made this commitment to Christ. That I know that he is who he says that he is. I believe that God is I'm the present. I believe that God is omniscient. I believe with all of my heart that God is all-knowing. I believe with all my heart that God is holy, that God is just, that God is righteous. I believe all of that. But what he says, you've got to go to the next level, that you believe with all of your heart that God is alive. He's not out there on some lofty throne that's unapproachable. He lives right here in the heart, sitting on the seat of authority if you're a born-again child of God. Amen, church? Think about this. When you pray, you're not praying to some being out there on some lofty throne in the universe. He's sitting right here with you. He lives within you. You have to believe that he exists. That's why I've said many times, when you come to him, you're not coming to an idol. You're not coming to a string of beads. You're not coming to a representation. You are coming to the living God of this universe who moves. And he says, if you're going to come to me, then you have to believe that I am, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God says, listen, you cannot come to me unless you have an intimate relationship with me. To be honest with you, you can't even get close to him. Because your walk and my walk with God is literally inauthentic if it does not increase your faith. That's what this verse is saying. That my walk with God isn't real. It's inauthentic. It's fake. It's phony. If it does not increase our faith. Family, do you understand that this is really what our life is about? And to be honest with you, I would argue that if we exist to glorify God, the practical way that you and I glorify God is by me believing in Him in the midst of the challenges that I experience within my life. Because everything else is theoretical. Throw it out the window. You can go to every Bible study <laughs> that you want to go to. You can have more Bible studies on your bookshelf that, oh, I went to this study and that study. But if your faith is not being strengthened, then your walk with God is inauthentic. There will always be gaps. There will always be situations. There will always be adversity within your life and my life. And when those gaps and when those adversities come, listen to me. They are gifts from God. Now, there's not a one of us that enjoy them. But to be honest with you, in these 66 years almost of my life, I never grew on the mountaintop. I grew in the valley. See, when we get on the mountaintop, we get a little egotistical, a little proud, and, man, we think, hey, I'm all right. I'm here. God, go worry about, go worry about Brandon. He needs it more than I do. Amen. Amen. You know, so we kind of get up there. We think we're in that safe haven. Amen. But man, you get in the valley, you get in the darkness, you get in the gap, you know where to go. That's where you grow. And these are gifts that you have to look at and understand that, that when you 
are running in those gaps, and, and you're not looking for an alternative way to get out of it, but you're resting and trusting and you're believing, that's when God comes through and you get to see the marvelous greatness and power of your great God. So let me give you four truths that I want you to take home with you today. Number one, take time to hear the Lord. To be honest with you, most of us are spending probably not enough time listening to God. God's probably speaking a whole lot more than we're listening. So let me encourage you, get alone with him, shut the door, be still, and know that he is God. Secondly, you've got to resist the temptation to edit what God says. Don't let fear reduce your faith. Because God is exactly the one who knows what it's going to take in your life and my life, and we're all different, what it's going to take in your life to stretch your faith. So what he says is don't edit it, don't reduce it down. And that's a temptation that all of us face. Thirdly, stare down your fears. Listen to me. Face them. I didn't say ignore them. They're real. But face them. Stare them down. Why can I say that? Because God is always greater than your fears. And then last of all, don't play it safe. Keep in mind, family, that your goal and my goal is not to be a reasonable Christian. Your goal is to be an obedient follower of Christ. So often, faith can be very unreasonable. It stretches you. It challenges you. It causes you in those moments to go, man, I don't know how, what I'm going to do, but I'm I have no place to go but to run to you, Lord. And so a lot of times faith can be very unreasonable. But remember, your goal in your walk and relationship with Christ is not to be a reasonable Christian. But your goal, the motivation of your heart and your life is always, always, always to be an obedient follower of Christ. As I said, we're living in a world that is changing A world that I believe we're going to have some great challenges in the days ahead and our faith will be put to the test. The question is, and always will be, when God puts you in those gaps and he puts you in those situations and he puts you in the midst of adversity, I promise you, we're all going to have it in life as long as we're on this earth. You make a choice. Do I choose faith and obedience or do I choose fear? Nobody can make that choice for you. Be an obedient follower because God rewards those who follow him in obedience. And when that happens, the floodgates of the resources and the power and the strength of God comes cascading into your life. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you this morning. I thank you so much that this simple reminder that, Lord, we got into this life by faith, we continue to walk this life by faith. And Father, I believe that there are those here today that you are speaking to. Maybe it's about giving their heart and life to Jesus Christ, that not about church membership, it's not about even being baptized, Father, it's about a heart that finally comes to the point that they see their sin and they recognize that you and you alone are their Savior. And they come to a point of brokenness and repentance and say, God, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and save me. And because of that, Father, they enter into a journey that is unbelievable because they enter this journey, this life by faith and trust and confidence in you. Father, for those that are here today that you are calling to be a part of this church, I pray that today by faith they would step out and say, you know what? It's time that we get plugged in. It's time that we're all in. It's time that we bring our gifts and talents and abilities to say, you know what? We want to be a part of a church family that's going to preach the word, exalt Jesus, that's going to bring him glory and honor and praise in all that we say and do. For those that you're calling, maybe to the mission field, that Father, you've been pulling and tugging in their heart, but they're scared to death, afraid, what am I going to have to give up? The Father, today by faith, they would step out, take a pastor by the hand and say, I'm committing my life to follow Jesus wherever he wants me to go. Lord, you know the needs in this room. You know the needs of those that are watching online today. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help them to exercise the greatest gift of all, that gift of faith and obedience. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.